Anyway, I want to talk about anticoagulation in ECMO, and uh, I got interested in this field because uh, where I work right now, we've done ECMO since 1994, so we're one of the old, old programs, and I still don't know how to do it, uh, but I'll tell you how not to do it, and I'll tell you our protocols, but I'm not sure I'm really telling you the right way, and there is no right way, but I will ex try to explain why we've done it so badly for so long and why we really still don't understand it is because we've always looked at the wrong thing. And so, anyway, what is the largest organ in the body? Everyone always says skin or liver. It's actually the endothelium. And the endothelium is now, by most anatomical scientists, is becoming an organ. And actually, all of us that deal with cardiopulmonary bypass, ECMO, critical care, seriously injured people, uh, seriously sick people, we're endotheliologists. We're not perfusionists, we're not intensivists, we're not cardiovascular surgeons, we're endotheliologists. And the endothelium is really a huge organ that we're just now starting to understand. And so essentially there are three modern anticoagulation strategies for ECMO, we all know them, but we have to go back to really why it's so hard to anticoagulate these people on ECMO. And a lot of it is, in the normal state, we are always in an anticoagulant milieu. Our capillaries are open, our endothelium is geared so that you will not coagulate. And so that you have absolutely good flow, so that you have good oxygen delivery to all parts of the tissue. The sicker you get, the more procoagulant you become. And a lot of it has to do with the endothelium. And this is what we've all learned, right? coagulation cascade, it ain't a cascade. I wish it was, because if it was a cascade, it would be very easy. This has only existed in the laboratory. It's never been proven in the human. Isn't that weird? And how many times have you been taught this? We've been taught this for 50 years. It's never been shown or documented in a human. But it's probably accurate to a certain degree. But it's not a cascade. In fact, if you look at um, most of the studies right now, and you start involving the endothelium, it becomes a revolving cascade. Not a downward cascade, but a revolving cascade, meaning it will cascade down to coagulation, then it'll come up to procoagulant, to anticoagulant, to fibrinolysis, and back and forth, and there are perturbations. And all of these things start becoming cyclical. And they're not a cascade that looks like everything downward falls. It actually, it'll fall, it'll go back up, it'll fall, go back up. And so we have to stop thinking of anticoagulation in this kind of a silly paradigm. And if you look at this, if you start taking the, and I actually had this as much more interactive on my iPad, it looked great. Um, if you look at this, look at all these feedback loops you start seeing that you get platelet, activated platelets, and you get feedback loops, and when you start getting the endothelial cell involved in the fibrin deposition interacting with endothelium, everything starts to change, and you get this huge, not a cascade anymore, but a very cyclical model. That becomes confusing, and so one of the great models that uh, we've looked at was actually take a tick bite. Easy, put on an animal, and you can follow the cascade. What happens is you will actually get, sorry, damaged surface area and vascular injury, and you'll get this cascade, but immediately you get fibrinolysis. The minute you start to coagulate, you'll get fibrinolysis. Immediately. So you're never in a coagulation cascade, you're actually in a circle. And that becomes really, really important. So I look at coagulation not as a cascade anymore, but as a phase. And I have uh, a partner that's an engineer, and so he's always talking about phase and phase uh, dynamics. And when you look at anticoagulation, it really becomes a phase dynamic. Because one of the things that you look at is you get the injury first, and you get a vascular phase. And you get vasoconstriction, you get release of uh, adenosine diphosphate, and other tissue factors, then you get a platelet phase, then you get activation of the platelets, then you get a coagulation phase, and then you immediately start a fibrinolytic phase. And I said they almost go 
automatically, but if you really look at it very, very closely, it becomes this phase phenomenon. And the phase phenomenon is driven not by these coagulation factors that we're always taught. It's actually driven by endothelium. And this is why we need to be endotheliologists and not coagulation people. And these are the areas that really are of interest. And again, like I said, as soon as the platelet phase starts and the coagulation starts, the fibrillinic phase starts also. So this becomes a very dynamic process. And this gives me a migraine every time I look at this. And I showed this because it gives me a migraine. But this is the endothelium. And what we don't understand even more is the subendothelium. And I've looked at this for several years. And it gives me a migraine because I can't stand it. Because what happens is not only do you have all of this endothelial interaction with coagulation and platelets and adenosine, now you get inflammation involved. So you get coagulation, inflammation, and the endothelium is the one that regulates it all. And what's wonderful is why are we able to do what we're able to do? Well, if you're doing bypass, they're pretty healthy. You're not generating a lot of inflammation. You have someone that goes on ECMO, they're sick before you start. They have tremendous inflammation, and they've activated this entire endothelial system. And it's what makes it so uh, annoying to study, because you have these growth factors that are coming out, you have foam cells, endothelium, there's about 12 types of endothelial type tissues now, uh, all of which generate nitric oxide, that generate selectins, that, that cause platelets to aggregate. All of these things generate tremendous um, inflammatory coagulation processes. And so this endothelium becomes what we really need to start paying attention to uh, when we start studying, particularly in ECMO. And so again, it becomes this phase type phenomenon. And this is a linear model that I kind of made just to show that you have not that happens in this linear model, but again, this phaseology that we're trying to, to grow instead of this cascade, it's a phase. You have this initial vascular injury, then you have this primary hemostasis, which is really just platelet aggregation. Then you have secondary hemostasis, which is the cascade that we've all known and loved for years and years and years. And then clot stabilization, which the one fact we've always ignored is factor of 13. And factor 13 is maybe the, one, the most important factor that we have, that we've ignored forever. And then right beyond this is fibrinolysis, the entire thing. So it wants to do this and then wants to race it off. And so again, that's why it makes it so frustrating to study. And if you look at a further model, you see that if you inhibit thrombosis, these are all the factors that make you not want to clot. And these are all the ones that make you want to clot. This is where we all live. And this is where we live when we get sick. And so what happens in ECMO is as soon as you say that someone needs to go on ECMO, they are in a procoagulant phase, and they're going to be very difficult to try to anticoagulate. And you are always behind the eight ball because you're in this phase phenomenon, and they're always in this favor thrombosis phase. Just another cartoon to irritate me even more, but again, the endothelium, look at all the things that go into this. All these affect anticoagulation. So it's not that simple cascade that we all learn. This is tremendous endothelial interaction with the cascade, and the cascade is regulated solely by the endothelium. So what do we do? We're not smart enough to do something better, so we put them on ECMO. What do we have? We add an artificial surface. What does an artificial surface not have? Endothelium, right? And no endothelium. So we have lost the one probably uh, ally we've had in the entire system. So we put someone on ECMO and we said they're procoagulant, but I know I've got this endothelium that will regulate it for me because it's smarter than, like I said, the dumbest endothelial cell is smarter than any of us. It really is, and it knows what to do. And it says, I have to keep these capillaries open so I can get oxygen transfer and I can make you healthy. But as soon as it starts coagulating, it starts trying to break it open, 
but it's regulated by the endothelium. So what do we do? Put 35, 40, 50, 60, 70% of the cardiac output through an artificial surface with no endothelium. So it's actually amazing that we can actually do it. Really, to me, it, it's astonishing. When you look at a bioartificial surface, and we've done this study uh, several times, one of the things that happens is you get fibronectin, vitronectin, and something we always forget about, von Willebrand starts depositing right on the artificial surface, and it's immediate. And it doesn't matter, heparin-coated circuits do not matter. This occurred beyond them. And what happens, you get platelet activation, you get all of these type of activation um, processes, and when that happens, what happens then is you start getting fibrin dep deposition. And this is why you have to anticoagulate uh, to a certain degree, but again, we don't know how best to do it. Again, this comes back to that phase phenomenon. Again, in minutes, on a bioartificial surface, you get platelet and fibrinogen activation, you get P-selectin activation from the platelets themselves, inflammatory cells then come in within days, and then weeks, you actually start getting foam cells and macrophages start depositing on the lining of the surface. And so all of this says, I'm gonna coagulate you, I'm gonna coagulate you, I'm gonna coagulate you, and I'm not gonna let you not coagulate me because I can't regulate. Here's something very interesting. When you lose in the regulation, you stimulate the kinin system, which makes you want to coagulate, and you stimulate the complement system, makes you not want to anticoagulate, but the, comp the coagulation system doesn't know what to do with that because it doesn't have the endothelium to regulate. That makes sense? Because the endothelium would normally say, I don't need this, I don't need this, I'm gonna deal with the middle or the right or the left, but you've lost that with an artificial surface, which is what makes it so painful to try to get someone through ECMO or even cardiac bypass. This is a time lapse that a colleague of mine from Chicago did, and he put on a bioartificial surface, and you can see these strands in eight minutes. Those are fibrin strands. And that's how fast it occurs. So within eight minutes, if you look at the time lapse he did 30 minutes, I'm surprised it even flows. It's that thick. But we're able to do it. And why? Because we trick the system a little bit, but not greatly. So what's the strategy number one that we've all used and used forever is heparin. And how does heparin work? We all know how heparin works, right? It's, it by itself doesn't do anything. You, I can give you all the heparin in the world, you have no AT3, it doesn't do anything. It's a cofactor, right? We all know that. And the cofactor binds not only factor 10A, it also inhibits factor two, it inhibits probably five, seven, maybe nine, uh, many other factors. But it has to have, uh, it is a cofactor. And so what happens is the AT3 becomes, is a very weak inhibitor of coagulation, and then without heparin, it really doesn't fit any clotting enzymes, but as soon as heparin's added, it changes the morphology of that AT3 that allows it to start binding thrombin, 10A, and then what happens, it dissociates, and you have more heparin release that can go to the next AT3, which is why AT3 becomes such an important player in ECMO and why we pay such attention to it. And I know you all do too, and, and most people have bypassed, but it becomes a much bigger player and start realizing it's the one thing that's working, one thing that's allowing this to work. And so we, again, like I said, we know that it binds, uh, it inactivates thrombin and other proteases, most notably 10A, uh, and it's a thousand-fold increase in the activity of antithrombin. So that's its real value. If you look at heparin-coated circuits, which everybody and their brother is selling, you still have to have AT3. And if AT3 is not there, because AT3 has to bind, it has to change morphology once it binds so that it can then bind to thrombin. And then it'll release itself. But think about this. This is why you have to regulate AT3. It's so important. 
even the heparin coated circuits, because it'll bind and it'll release. And if there's nothing there for AT, or there's no AT3 for that heparin to bind, it doesn't matter if you have a heparin coated circuit. If your AT3 is zero, you have all the heparin binding you want, it's not going to work. And so that's why we push AT3 so hard. <coughs> And we know this, y'all know this better than I do, uh, but certainly, you know, low molecular, or unfractionated and then fractionated heparin all kind of do the same thing. They just, this pentasaccharide sequence is what binds the antithrombin and then that binds prothrombin and 10A and other things. But it also, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, it's produced in the liver. We know it has varying degrees. Uh, but the optimal activity and how much you should give, we really don't know. And this is something that I struggle with and something I actually want to ask the audience uh, once I'm done with this talk, what everyone else does, because I really don't know. We actually had a, um, actually it was through the ELSO, I think there was 30 ECMO centers or 30 ECMO people came together a few years ago and asked, really, what do we do with AT3? And there were, 37 opinions, maybe 45, I don't know. But there was more opinions than there were people in the room. No one knew what to do. Uh, we all guaranteed we were doing the right thing, which tells you we're all doing the wrong thing, probably. And that becomes very important. So a lot of people say, well, I only replace with less than 30% activity. I only re replace with less than 50. It's probably not that simple. And it probably is maybe disease dependent. It may be age dependent. I know it's age dependent, but it's probably disease dependent. And it's probably what your goal is and what your you know, long term is. Is it VA? Is it VV? What kind of ECMO are you doing? Have they been on for 20 days? Have they been on for two? Have they been on for two hours? Those all probably go into the equation of what you do with AT3. If you look at most centers, and this is just that. 30 centers that were represented, most really try to keep their activity greater than 50%. Why? Only because they're using heparin as their major uh, goal or, or major source of anticoagulation. If you look at neonatal programs, many of those, uh, there was one program that said we keep them above 100 regardless. If they drop below that, we, we give them AT3. Others said we'll go to 80. Like I said, it was pretty much all over the place. And then we get, how do we monitor it? Because the other problem with heparin is it's a cofactor. And so because it's a cofactor, we also have all these issues with how do we monitor the best way to use it? Because we know that ACT has every low platelet count, uh, hypothermia, uh, serum proteins, all affect your ACT count. If you look at any 10A, 10A itself, factor 13 affects a 10A. It actually affects which um, type of uh, test you use because some will supplement antithrombin 3 for a 10A test and some won't. And so it depends on that, it depends on really how accurate your any 10A is. We've gone back to PTT just because the other is all over the place. If we're using heparin, we've just gone back to that. And then what do you do with antithrombin 3? And again, don't really know. But again, the problem with any 10 a which everyone jumped on the bandwagon, as soon as they got a good assay out and they got a fairly cheap test, everyone jumped on it. The problem is it's very, very, very finicky. And we have found big swings depending on your prothrombin level and your factor 7 and 8 level will affect your 10A very dr dramatically. And so we've pretty much, a, we'll use it occasionally, but mostly we've abandoned it. And then I've gotten calls from other centers that said, you know, mine's all over the place. And I said, what system do you use? Well, some of them will add any thrombin to the assay. And that is one test. Uh, it's through the Abbott test. And they will add any thrombin, which makes it a completely irrelevant test, really. So you have to really look at how you're using it and what test you have. Well, strategy two is my favorite and the one that I, we're, uh, 
actually have transitioned all of our adults to most of our teenagers, not PEDS yet, just because we don't have a dosing strategy yet, but that's direct thrombin inhibitors. And why would we use those? Well, let's look at the biology. One is it's direct and it doesn't need a cofactor. And when you don't need a cofactor, I'm not depending on something else. And it also inhibits both bound and unbound thrombin. And you can see here in this cascade, it's very simplistic, it's right at the end. And it inhibits it in the endothelium um, control over a lot of this. Because remember, the endothelium is what regulates a lot of your antithrombin-3 also. It's not really that dependent. So this is why we've gone to this method. Um, and again, um, Orgatroban is what we use. You could probably use any direct thrombin inhibitor. And we're using uh, APTT uh, one and a half, two times as our, as our marker. Uh, and of course, uh, we're using TEG. So, and again, it does not bind to plasma protein cells and it's not prone to day to day changes. And I think that's very, very important. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they're hyperinflamed, so they just got septic again, and so they dropped their AT3 to almost zero. It, you're not dependent on that kind of variation in day to day. And the other is no anticoagulation, which we're doing more and more and more. And the way that we're able to do this is really going back to this, is we give a lot of AT3. AT3 is a weak, very powerful anticoagulant, but it's weak. But with that, in heavy-coated circuits, we're able to bind this and we guarantee binding. Not any sites or a few sites, we guarantee we bind all the sites. And so we run our AT3s 50 to 70 percent activity. Not 100, 120, you don't really need it. But 50 to 70 percent activity, and we use 50 percent as kind of our goal. And the reason is, is that has shown us, just over the numbers, that it has kept the circuit as patent as heparin. Now, we have not compared it to direct thrombin inhibitors, but we use a lot of AT3. Thrombate versus recombinant? I don't know. <laughs> I wish I did. I like recombinant, uh, one, because it binds two sites. It has its uh, alpha, alpha, it's alpha, alpha, or beta, beta, I can't remember the, the which, but it's a little pure antithrombin as far as binding. Thrombate is a, a shoot and miss. The problem is they say give it, it has 18 hour half-life. That, that's the sales pitch. The problem is when AT3 binds thrombin, it's done. So it may have a half-life, but once you bind thrombin, it's gone. That antithrombin is no longer active in your process. And so I have a bias towards continuous infusion recombinant, but that's because I have a bias. It's not because it's accurate. I just have a bias for it. But I think any way that you maintain that 50% activity or higher in a non-anticoagulation regime, and we've done a ton. These are GI bleeders, head bleeds, and you'll run them for weeks. Uh, our longest on without anticoagulation is 20-something days. Um, I was at a meeting in, I can't remember, Houston, and I think they ran one for 30-something days but they maintained, without any coagulation, but they maintained their AT3s with heparin-coated circuits 50% or better. And I think that's very, very important uh, to keep that. And how you do it is up to you. Uh, what about aspirin? Uh, how many of y'all use aspirin in ECMO? Yeah, we, we're starting. Uh, we've used it mainly in, when we started seeing that what we're doing is not, they're getting more fiber in deposition. Um, the data is so horrible. Um, I can't recommend or disrecommend, but I'm saying I'm starting to use it more and more and more. Uh, I clearly use it after they're decannulated uh, for 72 hours at least, uh, just because of the number of case reports of post-decannulation thrombosis that's occurring. So I keep anticoagulation going for 24, and I keep aspirin going for at least 72 unless there's a contraindication. So how do you monitor? I don't know. Don't ask me. Uh, anyway, we're going to talk about bleeding for quickly because I think I'm running out of time. Um, 
Again, we talked about this before. What's the problem with bleeding? Well, we have this seriously in, injured or sick or septic or something patient that we're putting on ECMO. This is not your typical post-heart. And again, they have all these conditions. And one of the things that happens, if you see here, is a plasmatic coagulation system becomes very disruptive. And all of that becomes very, very confusing. But it all leads to coagulopathy in our sick patients. But this is the take home. I get this all the time. They have a GI bleed. Why are they bleeding? Well, they're on ECMO. They're on heparin. Heparin, AT, uh, DTIs, nothing causes bleeding. It won't let you stop bleeding, but it doesn't cause bleeding. You've got to look for the cause of bleeding. You can't just come in and say, oh, they're on ECMO. Of course they're bleeding. That's, that's unacceptable. And if you look at um, through TEG, and this was just published a few years ago. Almost all patients that are on show platelet dysfunction, not a big surprise. But look at this. 80% oops, have factor 13. Remember what factor 13 does? I'll show you in a second. But 79% have von Willebrand deficiency uh, or von Willebrand syndrome. 40% have fibrinogen. Um, and almost all patients showed at least a platelet count drop of greater than 20%. So again, this is because of lack of, lack of endothelial regulation. Um, and here's what factor 13 does, is remember that's that cross-link fibrin mesh. So what it does is when you lay down the fibrin, factor 13 comes in and then cross-links it. That's what gives it the clot, the strength. And we almost lose almost all of factor 13 activity with ECMO. What is DIC? DIC is a factor 13 deficiency. It's not anything else. We give it a lot of other, but if you look at the purity of it, it's factor 13 deficiency. And so this is, again, why we need that endothelium uh, back or we fake it out. And again, uh, centrifugal pumps show a higher rate of bleeding. It's a little dishonest because what happens is they compared roller pump technology then everyone adapted to centrifugal, but what have we done with the patient we've put on ECMO? I mean, prior to 2006, 7, they had cancer, they didn't go on ECMO. If they had leukemia, they didn't go on ECMO. If they were a transplant, they didn't go on ECMO. Now what are we doing? We're putting everybody and their brother on ECMO. And so what we're having is they're sicker patients. So it's a little dishonest, but the data is out there. So I just wanted to bring it up that it's out there, but I don't believe but that's actually true. I think it's those patients are just much, much, much sicker than what we used to put on. Causes of bleeding. I told you ECMO doesn't do it. Heparin doesn't do it. These do. And the biggest one that I deal with is chest tubes. Um, and if you, uh, we had a girl with flu a couple of years ago that they put in a chest tube because she had a 25% pneumothorax. They said, well, that's why she's hypoxic. Well, no one's going to be at 17 hypoxic from a 25% pneumothorax. If they are, they're not going to be that bad. Not to go on ECMO. They put in a chest tube. They scraped her fissure going in. Five bedside thoracotomies. She had 300 units of blood just because of one chest tube. She survived and did very, very well. In fact, she came back walking in and just to see us all in the unit. And, she, and I asked her mom how she's doing. She said, she'd be great if she had stopped smoking. <laughs> so, so I was depressed for the rest of the day. And this was just published a, a couple of years ago. And, I, and, uh, and it's in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. But I think it, it translates to all is if you look at major bleeding complications, look at the 22% of the complications and death related to a chest tube. Stop putting in chest tubes. If they have a pneumothorax, unless it impairs flow or impairs weaning, stop putting in chest tubes. Let them have their pneumothorax. They are not going to die from their pneumothorax. They will die from their chest tube. There is a time to put in a chest tube, and they don't need a surgical chest tube. They can do a pneumodart or something, a pigtail, because these are air mostly. These are not bloody. Um, and they're not, you know, empyemas. They don't need a surgical chest tube. A, a percutaneous, wire-guided um, pigtail is all they need 99.99% of the time. And so stop treating pneumothoraces. 
GI bleeding occurs about five or six percent, and if you look at it, uh, endoscopy, almost all of them are just stress gastritis. I'm sorry, it doesn't show over there, but stress gastritis. So if they have a GI bleed, bump up their PPIs, put them on a PPI drip, put them on a something, you know, add whatever you want, but most of the time, they don't need a lot of intervention. That's pretty rare, actually. But they, five or six percent will get it. Uh, and what we usually do in our, our institutions, we'll just take them off any coagulation for 48 hours, let them resolve it. If they need a scope, we'll do it. Um, and then we just try to allow that to heal a little bit and then restart. CNS bleeding, uh, we see it um, enough. Uh, but we actually looked at the ELSO registry a few years ago. We looked at traumatic brain injury bleeds. We looked at the ICD-9 code for traumatic brain injury bleed. Uh, there were only nine, believe it or not, in the 20,000 patients in, in the registry. There's only nine. The six out of the nine died. None of them died from advancement of their head bleed. They died from something else. So a CNS bleed is ne neither a contraindication to starting ECMO or to stopping ECMO. You can treat through it. You just control it. And again, in kids, it's age dependent. The younger they are, the more immature they are. And the earlier they put on ECMO, the more likely bad things are going to happen. But here's something interesting. <laughs> a study, they found that all the patients that they found in this study with head bleeds had a parent or a cousin or a brother that had a head bleed also. So it probably wasn't the ECMO or their disease. They may have just had this underlining process that was going to happen anyway. You just uncovered it early, or they bled a little bit, and you allowed it to, re to uh, coop. So VA and VV are different, uh, as you all all know, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, but if you look at it, uh, ECMO duration is leading cause of bleeding complications. Makes sense, right? The longer they're on it, the more likely they are to get stress gastritis, something else to happen, uh, to get a chest tube or something else. So uh, you just have to be prepared and aware and then controlled. And then, so this is what I do with bleeding. I diagnose, I adjust my parameters, I'll down adjust my goals of anticoagulation. I do factor supplementation, surgical intervention, and then TXA, I put almost everyone on. Uh, if they have any bleeding, and then factor seven if it's truly bad, and then I just keep going back in the loop. And um, I, we found this to work very, very well. Um, they just did a uh, study on factor seven a few years ago and found that it doesn't clot the circuit any faster. If it's going to clot, it's probably going to clot, but it will help the bleeding. And then how do we best diagnose? Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I'm a TEG guy, and we, I know we have a workshop on TEG this afternoon, which I think is awesome. Um, uh, I love TEG, and y'all all know this better than I, and I hope y'all teach me some TEG, but I love it because it's easy, because it's FFP, right? Plasma, fibrinogen, and platelets, and then if this becomes either wide, then it's fibrinolysis, so it becomes easy, reproducible, and we can get it pretty, pretty darn quick. That's it. So what do y'all do? I mean, what's, what's your regime? Because, like I said, there's, there's no, ELSO has put out anticoagulation guidelines, and they're pretty pathetic because they just say do something, you know, and tell us how, how it did. So how many use TEG routinely? That's, that's tremendous. How many use DTIs primarily? I love you. <laughs> so, no, that's great because, um, you know, I, I think it's a wave of the future. It's, a, you know, the way that we had to sell it to our institution because they came to us and said it's cost. Uh, but if you look at AT3 cost, if you look at measuring uh, AT3 and giving AT3, it actually is it's economically neutral. You, you don't make money or, or lose money, but it's economically neutral to heparin. So, and questions. 